Good morning. You look so good to me out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much um, to the Harvard Black graduates for inviting me. But it is not lost on me. Let's just make this clear that you invite me to Harvard and then you sandwich me between Dr. Cornell West <laughs> and my sister Congresswoman Presley. <laughs> so y'all better be good to me up here. <laughs> Just thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for thinking enough of me to include me in, in your day, in your ceremonies. As a public educator, for many years, I had people who would invite themselves in my classroom to speak. And I would say, you're not coming in my room with this foolishness. <laughs> my grandmother used to say to me, don't just let anybody pray for you. And that's how I stand here today, so it is not lost on me that you have invited me here on your day to speak, and for that I thank you. Um, thank you to the faculty, to all the faculty members here, and most of all, thank you to the students. Thank you for the students for thinking enough of me to want me to speak on this probably one of the most important days of your life. I will start by saying, full disclosure, if you're thinking about a good time to use the bathroom, now might be a good time because I am not paying off anybody's student debt. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> yet. But when I was thinking about my thoughts for today and planning for what I would say, you know, it, it's one of those things where you just channel everything you've heard, everything you know, and you say, what is something that I could say to you? And I thought of the words of Maya Angelou, still like air, I rise. And I stand here today with that same sentiment because at the core of black excellence, there's unbridled success in a world where there's no room for error. It is achievement through ultimate adversity, success despite everyone else's watching and waiting for you to fail. It is rising like dust, like air, like hope springing high in a system that is actively working against you. But that's okay. That's okay. I feel like I grew up almost expecting it. So I would walk into a room knowing that I had to work twice as hard, do twice as much, be on my A game all the time. It was what I did when no one was watching that helps me to stand here before you today. So I just want to tell you a little bit about who I am. And I feel like the concept of who I am is embodied in the story of Ruby Bridges. When I won the National Teacher of the Year Award, my husband asked me, is there anything that I can get for you? And I says, I would like the portrait of Ruby Bridges walking to school, the problems we all live with. And no one really understands why this is so important for me. And it is because when I got sworn in, this portrait of Ruby Bridges hangs in my office, right next to the photo of Barack Obama celebrating me as the National Teacher of the Year. So my story isn't about those two pictures. It's about the journey in between them. So the idea that this little six-year-old was escorted to school by federal officers going through hate-filled mobs where people were throwing garbage at her and racial slurs and epithets were, were all around her. But her parents said, I want what's on the other side of that door for my child. That's the education I want my Ruby to have. If it's good enough for your child, it's good enough for mine. So to go from that to me being celebrated at the height of my profession, out of 3.5 million public school educators in this country, for me to be elevated is really about the journey from this little girl and her parents fighting for an education 
to me being the one to represent education. And I stand before you and I say, I was built for this. We are built for this. Every day I look at this portrait, and every day I feel like I am both six-year-old Ruby, who was scared walking in, and 30-something whatever-year-old Johanna. <laughs> who is the embodiment of public education. Black excellence is having the audacity to walk past that fear, past that injustice, past that expectation towards the greater opportunity that exists on the other side. It's jumping through six more hoops than everyone else around you and being okay with it, being happy for it, being glad about it, because everything that happened to me during that journey has prepared me for such a time as this. Every single thing that happened, because I recognize, I'm smart enough to know that this is so much bigger than me. This is so much bigger than me. I occupy this space during this time only to make room for the next person who is going to do greater things than I could ever imagine. I talk about my childhood a lot, and I use the phrase, education saved my life. But I need for you to understand that's not just cliche for me. It is as literal as it gets. Education saved my life. I go home and I look around me and I see people who grew up in the same situation, the same circumstances, and they have not made it out. I have attended more funerals than I can think of read about more of my friends who are in jail, who are incarcerated, who are taking federal time and will never see the light of day on the outside of the bars. Education truly saved my life. So to see you all here having just completed an education, playing by the rules that didn't include you, that were set up to work against you, and saying, I'm OK with that. I was built for this. Check, check, check. Check, check. I grew up, and, and I say this because what I learned when I became National Teacher of the Year, there were all of these eyes on me, and all, everybody wanted to know who is she and where did she come from. And something happened because there's a whole process, if you can imagine, to becoming the National Teacher of the Year. You have people in your classroom, you submit a portfolio, there's uh, screeners and scorers and essays and part of this process was me writing my own biography and I wrote my biography and some well-intended stakeholders in my state said if you'd like for us to put another set of eyes on it before you submit it we'd be happy to do that and I got my document back my Google document with red lines through everything three paragraphs replaced by one sentence. I was the first in my family to attend college. <laughs> if it were only that simple. I grew up in the largest public housing project in the city of Waterbury. My mom was an addict most of my life. My grandmother took care of my brother and I along with our cousins in the same apartment. We had a three bedroom apartment and eight children who were not siblings by birth, but who grew up in the same household. We were the house where everybody came to eat. We were the house where if your mother was at home, you could come and my grandmother would take care of you. We were the house where my grandmother could cook anything without a recipe. But she didn't understand the pathway to success that came with education. And I just loved school. All I ever wanted to be was a teacher. And I worked hard and I studied hard, but life happened. I was the one who went home and wasn't sure if the lights were gonna be on when I got there. So to simply say I was the first in my family to go to college does not tell my story. I am, I stand before you, and this is where it gets crazy because I think when I saw that red line in that Google document, first I was sad, but then I was pissed off. <laughs> Because to see that red line erases 
every part of me. When I turned 17, I got pregnant with my daughter, which was not different than my mother who had me at 17 and my grandmother who had her at 17. I dropped out of high school, went to an alternative education program for teenage parents, and only years later, when I had my daughter and was thinking, I am so much bigger than this. I am so much better than this. And I won't even know the promise in my potential unless I try. I enrolled in community college, went back for a bachelor's degree, went back for a master's degree, went back for a six-year educational leadership degree. So to say that I was the first in my family to go to college does not begin to tell my story. But what I realized was that by me allowing that red line to exist, I was blacking out the journey of all of the students and the people in my community who had stood up, who had supported me, or who were at some point in that journey and did not know what was on the other side. I am the sum of all of those parts. That is black excellence. Because to say that we are defined by your terms and how you think that experience should be acquired, I can legislate in Congress because I know what it's like to be every one of those people. To be a teenage mom, to be a single working mom, to be in a two-parent professional household, and at every stage, my kids deserve the same education as everybody else's. So this idea that it is only the parents who know how to advocate for their kids, only those kids deserve a shot. One thing I knew for sure is that my grandmother loved me. You can't, nobody can tell me different than that. She loved me. She may not have had the language or the understanding, but she loved me. So to say that we can only listen to the parents or the communities that have the language to have the conversations that we could understand is flawed. And every single one of us has a responsibility to stand in intercession for kids who can't stand for themselves, who have nobody else standing up for them. You leave here today, degree in hand, with a platform and a voice and a message because somebody is depending on you to speak for them. I deserve that opportunity. Your kids deserve that opportunity. You are the embodiment of a life draped in grace. You get to stand here because somebody stood before you. You have a responsibility. Just like this brother said, you have a duality right now. You have a duality. You have the road before you, but this is not it. The road behind you is so much more important. There is so much power and so much shame every time I hear the statement that I am the first African-American woman to be elected from the state of Connecticut in Congress. Just think about that. And we're, I'm from Connecticut. We're supposed, New England, we're the good ones. We are the warriors for social justice. Just think about that. So I need for you to understand that every time I walk down these halls now as one of 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, every time I walk, I know that there are people who are saying, who let this happen, and how did she get here, and who are actively working against me. But I also know that there's a little brown girl in Connecticut who is looking at me, and through me, they see themselves. Through me, they understand that the journey is just as important. So in closing, I will say, do not diminish or devalue any part of who you are in order to wear that robe and walk with that tassel. Do not blur out. Don't let anybody draw a red line through you. Don't do it. Because there is somebody here, somebody who is looking for you. You were built for this. You are built for every part of this. You have a burden and a responsibility to pay it forward. You 
you are here today because you are excellent, because you are beautiful. When people said to me, I don't see color, then you don't see me because I know I'm black. Leave here today knowing who you are, understanding what your responsibility is. Look at the sun and jump. You might land, you might not, but you will never know unless you try. And there is somebody depending on you to at least try. I don't even know what this paper says. <laughs> Congratulations to the Harvard Black graduates of 2019. You are my hero. You are my hero. Thank you. To God be the glory. To God be the glory.